we're able to make these seminars free to the public like this because of the graciousness of a number of solar businesses. Um, so we'd like to thank Alta Pro Electric, Evergreen and Gold Renewables, uh, Kubi Renewable Energy, uh, the Solar Superstore, and of course the City of Edmonton. Uh, I've asked Rial Bouchard to be our uh, MC for the evening. Um, Rial is a former uh, chair of the Solar Energy Society of Alberta. He's the CFO of National Solar Distributors based here in Edmonton and a longtime solar pioneer. Uh, since 2006, he's had the pleasure of working directly with some of the brightest minds in the industry. In 2015, Rial uh, received his MBA from the University of Alberta, where he focused his degree in the area of strategic management and corporate finance. So uh, we got four good speakers in front of us here today, and uh, we'll be talking about um, you know uh, solar for for commercial buildings, and I think it'll be a pretty interesting. Uh, interesting evening. So, uh, so the first speaker is uh, Robert Oberlander. He's the communications manager at IKEA Edmonton. And he's been with the organization for almost one year. He's the head of IKEA Edmonton Sustainability Committee and also oversees several of IKEA's nonprofit and chari charitable efforts throughout Edmonton. Prior to working at IKEA, Robert was the communications coordinator for the city of North Battleford. Um, we did recently set up our uh, solar array. Construction concluded earlier this month on our roof. It is part of a broad um, sustainability initiative, which IKEA has actually been a part of for a very long time. I'm going to go over a brief, uh, do a brief overview of the efforts we are making in the Alberta province. Then I'll go into some details regarding our solar array. Our global commitment is to be energy independent by 2020. Um, our, the solar panels on our store, as well as the location in Calgary, those are essential to it. But another major factor is our is we've also set up two wind farms in the province, um, Old Man Two, and Wintering Hills Wind Farms in Alberta. They produce about 130 megawatts, enough to power 86 IKEA stores and 41,000 homes. That's also part of our initiative here. Currently, we're producing four times the renewable energy that is used in daily operations th through rooftop solar, wind, and geothermal sources. No, IKEA, we are strongly committed towards uh, a building a sustainable future. Uh, well, we put out a press release about a half year ago about how we're getting rid of plastic straws, and while we haven't done it yet, we were surprised how almost overnight Starbucks got rid of their plastic straws. It's, it's so this is part of a bigger initiative. But anyway. We're here, we're here to talk about solar. So, so let me show off some of our uh, some of our older projects and when one of our well, our store. So this is the uh, Dartmouth location in uh, Nova Scotia. It's a ballasted roof, as, as you can see. It, it overlooks uh, well, it, it overlooks the ten, the town quite a bit, and it's a it's a fairly large array at uh, 863 kilowatts AC, 850 kilowatts DC, and it's a ballasted system. We find the ballasted systems to be uh, we, we tend to use those a lot. Now that, that part of that comes with the, the characteristics of our roof. It's a flat surface, so it makes sense to just put weights on them as opposed to perforating the roof, which you might have to do depending on the, your structure. Um, for our system, these are some great shots. Please, at the end of the presentation, you'll see my email address. Yeah, if, if you want a copy of these images, we can, we, we can probably work out distributing them. Um, so these are just some photographs of our completed system. It has not been accurate, um, activated yet. It is still being wired, but I think it looks uh, it looks fairly impressive. I believe it's the largest one in town right now. So details about our system. It's an eight, 840 kilowatt system, eight, um, 1060.3 kil kilowatts DC. It consists of 2,905 solar panels um, with a power class of 365 watts. The panels are at a 10 degree pan panel tilt, and it's a ballasted system. So w there's no penetrations in our in our roof. So if we find a like so our our building a few years ago, we actually expanded the size of our building. So if we wanted to expand the roof further, we could very easily uh, put more on. Or if you know if for whatever reason we wanted to take some offline, it'd be very easy. Ballasted systems they, that means they're just held in place by um, these the concrete slabs which you might see in the picture here. Uh, so we, we use those to keep the system in place. And um, yeah, 35 string inverters rated at 24 kilo, uh, kilowatts each. That's kind of an overview of, of, what, uh, of what our roof system will be like. And once again, thank you for having me tonight. I look forward to your questions.
David De Bruyne. So David De Bruyne started in the electrical industry um, when he was 16 years old through the Registered Apprentice Program. Over the past 15 years, he's been involved in a wide range of projects from multifamily, commercial, industrial, and solar photovoltaic projects. David is acting manager of the renewable generation portfolio for Alta Pro Electric, responsible for the complete design and turnkey solutions for clients tailored to each site-specific need. So, all right. so behind me here is the uh, Alta Pro Electrically Net Zero building. We're just north on 149th Street by the Yellowhead by Speeders. So if you don't get caught by the train, uh, I would be happy to tour you tour you up on the roof and take a look at the array. Uh, as uh, you've introduced me before, I'd still like to say, you know, I'm, I'm David DeBruin. I'm a Red Seal Master Electrician and a professional electrical contractor. Uh, you know, I'm a design build contractor, so we take buildings that have no drawings, we'll get them from concept to completion. That's our forte. And uh, bolting on with NMAX, uh, it really fit with our business portfolio. You know, it really we wanted to have something that we could give our clients for a full picture. Um, so being an NMAX solar dealer, what that means is we can access their financing and as well as their warranty. Uh, and that plays a big part in uh, O&M on these systems. Uh, an owner operator at Altspro and as well as the net zero building. So why solar? You know, and I'm not gonna sugarcoat it, it came down to the financials. Uh, I have more details in the slides going forward, but there was some financial savings there to be had. Uh, we can attract tenants with 100% renewable energy to power their businesses. And, I, you know, there's not a lot of other companies in Alberta that can offer that to their, to, to their tenants. So that was a big adder for us. Um, controlling op costs and hedging your risk. Uh, for other building owners out there, there are a lot of moving parts to operating a building and knowing what you're going to pay for energy and being able to hedge your risk is a it's a it's a big plus you know now that we are electrically net zero when you hear that power price is going up we actually you know you can smile a little bit because we're hedged where it's okay it's not as not as bad um, we want to become more competitive in the marketplace for lease rates and by knowing what we're going to be paying for our energy we're able to get there and of course gaining a building asset that pays for itself is always a uh, a good bonus and environmental attributes so when you walk into our building, we have a TV screen. It shows uh, all the uh, energy we've saved, and it's only been in operation for about three quarters of a year, but it's crazy to see how much energy we've offset uh, from the uh, GHG reduction to uh, the equivalent of trees planted. So it's pretty cool to see when you walk in in the morning. Um, we get it on our phones as well, so it's really cool to see. A little bit of a system overview. Uh, it's a 217.6 kilowatt DC array and there are 544 LG 400-watt modules. Uh, so these are Tier 1 modules. There are, there are a lot of other modules out in the industry, but uh, in our opinion, these are some of the best. There are a lot of other good manufacturers out there, but you really do get what you pay for. So in, if you are a client looking for a solar system, that is one thing to definitely key in on. Uh, the solar modules are ballasted, much like the uh, IKEA stores. Uh, they just sit on metal racks and they're weighted down with ballast weights and there are no penetrations. The only ones that we had were actually up, if you look by the W by system overview, there's two little conduits there. We poke through the roof there by choice just because we didn't want pipes come out the side of the building for aesthetics. Um, they are fixed at a five degree angle facing south so there's no moving parts and O&M was a big thing to us. We, didn't, we wanted something that would be fixed and set there for time. So. Uh, there are string inverters with optimizers, and, and what that means is behind uh, each of the solar modules, there's a little black box that shows how the module's doing, all the production it's had in the past, and if there's ever a problem, it, it actually emails us. So um, in O&M, that's a, that's a big thing for us. You know, if there's a problem, it, it tells us if there's a problem. We're not searching for it. And uh, we are grid tied. We don't have any batteries on the system. So uh, when we make excess energy and we don't consume it on site, we sell it. We don't store it. Uh, building owner advantages, um, so with a single electrical meter, some of the benefits realized are, and I got a lot of words up here for, for this slide, but uh, in a nutshell, how we metered our electricity in each of our tenant bays, we had a separate meter, and it only allowed us to go after a very small system. So what we did is we, we scrapped that and put one big electrical meter on there so we could go after a very large system for the entire roof. 
because uh, uh, according to the permits here, you're not allowed to put on a system uh, or produce more energy than you can consume. So we needed to increase our load. So we went to one meter. Uh, by doing that, we got a bigger system, which meant bigger tax write-offs. So that was a, a great bonus. Uh, another one that we kind of realized afterwards was, you know, if, if we have a tenant vacancy and we have the solar system and there, there's no load because the tenant's not there, we're selling all that energy from that system. So it's a little bit less of a kick in the pants when you don't have a tenant there and you're selling the energy uh, at the pool price. So that was a good positive. And as well, the asset is the building owners and not the tenants. So building owner challenges, and, and this was where it was nice to be, you know, we're an electrical contractor, but at the same time, we were the client in this one. So we were able to see, you know, what it's like on the other side of the fence, and it was good to have that angle. So we had to modify our, our lease rates and structures, and uh, that's not something that happens very easily. So it was uh, definitely a, a challenge. you got to look at... Um, a lot of operation costs and how you charge for that. So that was a, a little bit of a hurdle we had to go over, but still something that was uh, very attainable. And as well, we had to take time to understand energy, how it's billed, and how it can make sense financially. So when you get your electrical bill, you have your transmission, distribution, energy, admin costs, and maybe some other bogus ones that the retailer puts in there, but you gotta understand all that and what, and what that means. There's, there's a lot of things going on in that bill that Normally, you just look at it and be like, oh, you just kind of pay it. And you don't understand it. But uh, you're buying interactive grid inverters. So um, those things are married to that bill. And you want to know what you're affecting on that bill. What number are you going to be changing? So understand the effect of the asset and also the tax effects. So this is a little bit of a snapshot of how we had our financial performer on this one. Obviously, it's very high level. We got a lot of Excel sheets. But... Um, for this one, we had a 136 kilowatt hour load on the building. That's with all of our tenants. And at an average rate of six cents a kilowatt hour, we'd pay about $8,300 in energy and 14,400 in transmission distribution costs. And if you go to the right of that, there was no tax savings um, for year cost of 22,700. Uh, that's just something you pay as, a, as there's no, no return on investment on paying grid tied power. You pay it and you kind of move on. Uh, Going down with our building with solar, so same load, 136,000 kilowatt hours, and this is statistical data that we've pulled. Uh, our system is going to produce over 200,000 kilowatt hours of energy, and we'll be net exporting around 63,000 kilowatt hours. So at some point in time when we're not using the energy and it's, uh, we're not using it on site, we'll be selling it back uh, for about a yearly gain of $3,800. And transmission distribution costs. So that's something that it's different in every area, but uh, we're going to shave off about 10% of our transmission distribution fees. So that number goes down to 12.9. And with solar, so this is something we didn't have before, we have about 15.5 for financing fees that we pay. And go over the right again, we got now tax savings we can take advantage of through depreciation with this new asset uh, $5,300 for a yearly cost of 19204 so that's a difference of $3,500, and that's huge. I don't, for other businesses out there, we have an asset in a loan situation that's paying itself off that's cash positive. That's, that's huge. You don't get that a lot when you, uh, when you buy a new asset like that. So that's something to key in on. Another financial snapshot. So our system cost was just over $400,000. Uh, it was a complete turnkey project, and on the client uh, end of things, it was, uh, it was relatively easy. So we... After making the agreement with NMAX, you know, you kind of step back and they, they, they took the rest of it, uh, NMAX and Altapro, so they take over the, the grant application, all the financing, and all the construction. Uh, the Government Alberta grant, we got just over $100,000 from a rebate from Efficiency Alberta. Uh, that is not a small amount of money, and that was huge to get, and without that, it really throws your financial performers out the whack, so that was a, that was a big win to have. The system cost after the rebate just over $300,000 and we chose to put an extra $100,000 down uh, to get a finance rate of 2%, fixed for 15 years and 15 year warranty. So we were given the option as the client, you know, you could either go 3% and use the government's money as a down payment or go uh, double down and get 2%. Uh, that's cheap money as well. I, I don't know if anybody else out here who knows a uh, 15 year finance rate for two years or, or for 2%. That's, that was a, a really good win, as well as the warranty. 
Uh, if you've got a, a building and, it's, and you've got a, an asset that's going to be there for a long time and you can have it under warranty for 15 years, that was a, a really big key point that we looked at. And our monthly payments of just over $1,200. So I think I'm a little more my time here, but I'm pot committed, so I'm going to keep on going. Uh, intangible benefits, so uh, we had a big ribbon cutting ceremony and it was great to see we had um, Alberta infrastructure out there, uh, Energy Efficiency Alberta spoke and some other dignitaries and it really put our building on the spotlight. Uh, it was really great to see. And uh, we're Alberta's largest electrically net zero multi-tenant building. We currently hold the title, the heavy white title, so until there's one out there that has that, you can come take it from me, but we have it for now, which is good. Uh, our employees, they, they do see the benefit as well. Um, you know, I, I think I see that with solar in Alberta, it's something that it wasn't uh, very prevalent in what you heard day to day. And as you see solar going up on the IKEA, our buildings and around, it really starts to uptake and, you know, it becomes more of a, um, something that's more accepted. So we have uh, our houses have it on there. And uh, another intangible benefit that's kind of hard to put a number to is, you know, when we're looking for tenants and we can say that we have 100% renewable energy, I don't think a lot of other companies have that. So I would like to think that we could find tenants faster if we had to, not that we do anymore, but um, that's, a, that's a really big intangible benefit for us. So solar and business, uh, take advantage of the, the grants while they're still around, guys. Um, that's not a small amount of money to leave on the table. Not, I don't think the grants are going away anytime soon, but uh, it wasn't something we were going to let it see go by. And also take advantage of the tax uh, depreciation. Uh, with the CRA, you can depreciate things at 50% on a declining basis. Uh, that's pretty heavy. So that's really good for cash flow. Look into that and see what works for your system. And finance your projects over time. It works really well with cash flow in the business perspective. And if you use a lot of energy and you pay a lot of tax, you can be cash positive the entire term of a loan. So that's something to really key in on. And uh, explore financial models. There are a hundred ways to slice a solar system, your ROI, and it's very subjective. Um, so really dig into it. You know, putting, putting my contractor hat back on and not being the client, I get that question quite often, you know, what's your ROI? What's your ROI? Um, but I always answer, it depends, and it really does, because to, to accurately say that to somebody, you need to know their tax bracket, you need to know their interest rate, uh, are they putting more money down, what is their energy rate that they're paying, and also the transmission distribution toggle. So those, those are those two line items on your bill that they never go away. You have your admin fee, and depending on where you are in the city, uh, you actually get a better value for your solar. So there's a, there's a lot of factors to that to look at from a, uh, from a commercial perspective. Um, and really make good use of the solar professionals in the room. You know, there, there's a lot of good knowledge in this room here, and I really urge you guys to corner one of them and ask to see if solar is right for your business. So I think I was in front, so I didn't quite see, but how many solar contractors are here in the room right now? If you put your hands up. Yeah, there's a lot here. So uh, if you guys have any questions for your commercial business, definitely uh, ask them to see if there's some, something you can add some value to your, to your business. So big special thanks to Efficiency Alberta. You know, $100,000 is not a small amount of money to get for a grant. So that was huge and got our project uh, some legs. And as well to CESA. Uh, you know, Rob and the team, you guys do a lot for the industry and it's really great to see uh, you know, your guys' website, it has a lot about uh, first getting into solar, some quick facts, so take a look at that. It's a really good website. So thanks a lot, guys. That's all I have. So, Our next speaker, Clifton Lofthog, is the Donald Trump. Oh, sorry, the president uh, is what I meant. I know Clifton well, so I can joke with him about that. Of Great Canadian Solar, which has been operating in Alberta solar industry for almost 10 years. Good. During that time, he and his company have been involved in engineering and constructing some of the largest commercial rooftop solar systems in the province. He's a professional engineering technologist, master electrician, NABSEP certified PV installer, and loves it when his clients combine solar energy with electric vehicles. So I'm going to present today a little bit on the considerations if you're looking at putting a commercial scale solar system onto your building. Uh, a little bit of the year view. Uh, what are some of the important aspects of your building to consider before solar? And then a little bit of a lessons learned, I guess, about over the 
the past almost 10 years that I've been doing solar, what, what would I take? What would I put on my roof? Um, what would be the, probably the, the best system to have on your roof? And, you know, everybody will have their opinion on this, but um, I'll kind of give you mine. So the initial steps would be learn what you have for a solar resource. Uh, you could have the, the biggest roof space, you know, available, but, you know, if you own, own Roger's uh, place and your next door neighbor to the south is a Stantec tower, you're, you're not going to have much of a solar resource. So it's best to know that. So uh, the graphic on the upper left-hand side is from a sole metric uh, Senai. And what it is is a, uh, a special camera. You can go onto a roof any place take a, a quick picture and within a few minutes know exactly how much sun or how much of a solar resource your roof does have. Uh, this particular shot, uh, it was showing in the upper right hand part of that picture is trees. Uh, they're causing shade, which will shade more in the later half of the year as well as later half of the day. And as well, there's some tree, trees on the left hand side. So really easy to know exactly what you have for a solar resource. Um, a little more complex is actually understanding your utility bill. The energy part, fairly simple, but the transmission and distribution is a, is a very complex thing to start looking at, especially when you start looking at the commercial rates. Um, but to know how your consumption and production affects those T&D rates um, really helps the ex economics of solar. So. Um, to be able to work with somebody to, to dig into that and also to look at, you know, peak demand, how does that affect um, your bill? The solar can help your peak uh, demand and what that is, if you don't know, is um, your meter will register the maximum amount of power you ever consume at one point in time. So if you end up uh, consuming really heavily, say some motors turn on, you start welding, that peak is going to take into account, be taken into account in your transmission and distribution. What uh, solar can do, but you can't really count on it, is if you have solar active at that point, it can reduce that peak. Um, the only way to really um, make sure that you, you reduce your peak demand is to uh, install a peak shaver. I think that's going to become a little bit more prevalent here in the next few years in Alberta as we start looking at just distribution and transmission fees more and more. Um, kind of they're, they're, they're kind of being dig dug into a little bit more by everybody. So the initial steps, um, you want to assess your current condition of your roof. Um, picture in the upper left hand side is kind of the extreme. Um, that's an asphalt shingle roof, uh, obviously well past its life. Um, it w it's literally like walking on, you know, potato chips up there. Um, so got to have a, got to have a good roof to put a good solar system on. So if it does need replacement, what product should you use? Um, we're a big fan of if you have a ballasted or sorry, if you have a, a pitch roof is a standing seam roof, which I'll get into a little bit later and in, into why it's so good, but it really allows you to install solar at a very economical rate. Probably, probably the best rate. It's probably the most, co the most cost effective way of installing solar, uh, in the industry today. Some limiting factors um, as to the size of system that you can. Um, available roof space. Um, obviously, you can, if you run into problems as far as that goes, you can move to a ground mount system as well. Uh, carports are really great, uh, especially in a commercial setting, and especially if you put a electric vehicle charging station on, sort of like Simon's did. If you haven't been to Londonderry Mall recently, in the northern part of the mall, uh, Simon's moved in there probably about a year ago now um, with uh, a very large carport uh, with bifacial modules. It's, it's quite uh, a system, uh, very pretty to look at. Uh, as well, um, another thing that can limit you uh, is your electrical system. Uh, depending on the, the year, the, uh, the size of it, uh, the voltage level, uh, that could be a limiting factor as well. We, uh, we did a project a couple years ago on a rec center uh, to the south of Edmonton. Uh, had an electrical system in there from about eight years old. Uh, had a lot of capacity in it, wasn't a problem to, to connect into it. 
A um, couple months later, doing another rec center, another megawatt system, probably a 20-year distribution system in there. There was no capacity to be had. Um, had to kind of think outside the box, and what we ended up doing was actually tapping into the secondary, the transformer there, uh, to avoid having to replace all their switch gear and have outages and really make try and keep the cost effectiveness of the system there without uh, having to spend, you know, $50,000 on a, on a distribution replacement. Um, and then on the utility side, uh, the utility transformer can be a real choke point as well. We run into it uh, a lot, mostly in agricultural settings where in order to offset, you know, all what the farmer needs, you put a need to put, say, a 50 kilowatt system out there. Farmers happy to do it. They want to do it. What happens is the utility transformer feeding that, that farm um, is only 25 kVA, so you can only do half of that. Um, so you look at upgrading the transformer. That's, you know, a couple thousand dollars, not a big deal, but it's the distribution transmission fees increases that come with it afterwards that really uh, make it hard for that farmer to, to get that solar system because they end up being so much of the revenue that the system would generate for them. So that's kind of a sore spot of me. I really wish um, you could upgrade transformers a little bit more easily, a little bit more cost effectively so that it doesn't deter people from going to larger systems. And then budget. Everybody's got budget. So um, that, that's kind of very client dependent there. So some important things to also to consider. Um, the power quality at the building. Um, we actually ran into this uh, problem. Um, if you're familiar with what harmonics are, um, nobody ever really thinks. It's not something you see. But kind of to look at the graph on the upper left hand side. The red smooth wave is a, is a waveform that everybody kind of is used to seeing. That's what a good healthy waveform looks like in a building. Now electronics, um, computers, LED lighting is actually a really uh, bad source of harmonics. Uh, a lot of people or some buildings go in and you got to be careful with the LED lights you actually put in because it can give you a harmonics issue afterwards. Um, and what a harmonics issue is, is that black waveform that kind of is following the, the course of the red one. Um, it's not healthy, it's not really good, uh, creates a lot of problems on your neutral current, a lot of imbalances. Uh, when we put a large scale system in, what happened was uh, I believe the harmonics were there ahead of us. But when we put the system in, it gave an opportunity for those harmonics to really make themselves felt. And what they did was create imbalances on the system that caused the, uh, the main breaker to trip in the building. Um, nobody's happy when their main breaker trips, especially in the building the size that it was. So we can, we were trying to figure out what was going wrong. We were sure that it was a harmonics problem there before. Um, the utility said it was fine, so at the end of the day, the client wanted their system on, so we went in, made some changes, got it so that it worked, but it would have been nice to have that snapshot of what the, what the, uh, what the uh, harmonics issue was beforehand, so we could kind of uh, learn from it a little bit more. So, uh, also, um, any existing or new roof warranty that you're looking at, um, if you have uh, an Alberta Roofing Contractors Association warranty right now, if you're working in the industry, you know it's very tough to put solar on an ARCA uh, warrantied roof. Um, kind of stay with what they want to see on the roof. It drives costs up massively and you get a much smaller system than what you want. Um, we've been on projects that have mandated that warranty but have moved away from it after realizing that what a problem it was going to be to put solar on that roof and stay within the, the uprights to get, keep that ARCA warranty. So they went to like a Suprema, a warranty, a uh, different warranty vendor. Um, allows us to put a ballasted system on, which is what AltaPro has and was talking about there. Uh, no roof penetrations, wonderful. And then another thing to bring in is your accountant. Um, they love number crunching. There's a lot more to solar beyond simple payback. 
there's net present value, there's internal uh, uh, rate of return, thank you Gordon, uh, tax uh, savings to take into account, um, reduce risks for the cost of electricity rising. Um, there's so much more than just simple payback that people and business people need to consider. Um, and then once you've decided to go solar, and if once I get a building and put solar on it, what kind of system will I put on? Well, for number one, it's going to have an engineer stamp drawing or a system on it. Um, you, that uh, picture in the upper left-hand corner is actually a system that was put in North York, Ontario. Um, structural engineer, from what we understand with the industry, because you don't hear that much about it, um, is that structurally engineered perfectly, the contractor decided to take some side, decided to reduce some costs in some very poor cho poorly chosen areas, uh, namely putting cross bracing in. So this array was elevated and pitched across this entire roof. I think you can actually see part of the array on the very left hand side. So it went all the way across this building. Um, the only thing holding it up on this side is actually some cell, I believe some cell towers there. Um, so uh, pretty significant. Um, so get two structural stamps, um, one to make sure it won't fly off your roof, one that won't fall through your roof, and then get an electrical stamp on it as well, uh, just so you have that peace of mind that things won't, uh, shouldn't go sideways. Uh, I'd highly recommend getting a roof inspection prior to construction. Um, that way you know that your roof is in good shape prior to uh, anyone being on it. Uh, have the solar contractor come through, let them have a look at it. Um, that way if there is an issue afterwards, it's highly likely going to be on the contractor and there's no pointing fingers back and forth. Um, whenever we step onto a project with a new roof, we always get the roofer to go through doing a thorough inspection, thorough test, and then uh, to avoid any, any finger pointing of, you know, we, we want to know where the blame lies really is what it comes down to. And then, yeah, you use tier one manufacturers, um, LG, Trina, Canadian Solar, Q-Cells, um, on the inverter side, SMA, Solar Edge. Um, I'm sure I'm missing a lot out there. There's a lot of, a lot of companies. Um, most of them with 25 year warranties. Um, so if these companies aren't going to be around for 25 years, there's no point in having a 25 year warranty. So don't go for anything that's kind of, I don't know, I guess hokey, cheap. Um, stick to the big guys. Uh, they have great equipment, great warranties, uh, and they're going to be around to, to cover that warranty. Um, and I definitely go with a non-penetrating mounting system as well. Uh, a ballasted system, which is uh, the picture on the upper left-hand side, that was actually up in Fort McMurray. The, uh, in order to save weight, uh, because there was probably about four inches of gravel on this roof at about, they're about one inch pieces of gravel. Um, we actually scooped up, put them in those ballast bags, the black bags there, and reused the ballast on the roof to hold it down. Um, it was a little bit close on the weight whether, uh, they could hold it or not, but by not ad adding our own concrete blocks onto this system, but actually using this roofing existing material, it made it work. So um, it was fun. I can say that because I didn't do it um, because <laughs> to pick up all those rocks and such, it was uh, a nightmare. There was one point where it was very late in the fall and there was a freeze thaw going on and they weren't able to scrape gravel up in the morning because it was frozen but they had to wait a couple hours and do other things and then it would loosen up and they'd pull it all up. It was, I was impressed with the people who did this really because it was, it was probably the toughest project we, we'd ever done. Uh, 636 kilowatts of that, so yeah. Um, and then, uh, or a standing seam metal roof. Uh, that's on the upper right hand side. Uh, you can use clamps that pinch onto the folds of the, uh, the roof. Um, nice about that. It's very quick to install, it's very light. It's probably only adding three pounds a square foot onto it. Um, honestly, the most cost effective way of, of installing it. And you can see some rails on the picture down below that are installed uh, by this exact method. And then my personal preference is to not put power electronics underneath the modules. 
it's another point of failure um, to go and build a beautiful array and then, you know, a year's time have to go and replace three, four, five uh, of those units and having to remove modules to get at them and everything. I just prefer a straight string inverter um, whenever possible. Uh, that's a lot easier now thanks to Gordon Howell and taking on that fight to, to, to allow us to do that uh, and get back to the basics a little bit. Uh, there are great instances to use power electronics if you've got shading, if you've got, if, if you want to really crunch the numbers, but uh, we kind of find our clients like looking at the numbers probably for six, eight months and then they kind of stop looking at it so very often. So. Um, again, I would, if there's a failure, I'd want it in an easily accessible inverter that I can just pull down and put another one in. And then I really think uh, having a system that's viewable to the public is hugely important. A uh, picture in the upper left hand center is the, uh, the Mosaic Center. Um, on the very top that you can see is uh, snow covered is the solar system. Uh, and then on the south and the west corner is an integrated solar system. Um, people standing there for the bus, people walking by can see the walls, they can see it, they can understand that there's solar in this building. Otherwise, you never know uh, that it was ever there. Uh, we did projects, well we've done numerous projects, flat roof projects, and people will never know that there's a system up there uh, because you just can't see it from the ground. So to engage the public and you know, get people talking about solar, very important. And then uh, I would install an energy monitoring system. I mean, very cost effective, very low cost, and teaches you a lot about when you're using your power and when you're producing power. Um, it's it's, it's kind of neat to see how in the summer months you start, you can get into that point where you are producing more in a day than you're actually consuming, uh, depending on your load, of course. And then uh, my final thing is I'd buy local. Um, there's lots of great solar installers in Alberta. Um, man, talented, uh, hardworking, um, and been doing it for a while. So I would strongly recommend that you you buy local and call these guys up and yeah, work with them. Next speaker is Gordon Howell. Gordon Howell has a BSc in electrical engineering from the U of A in 1975, and has been exclusively working in the solar industry for 41 years. He co-founded Howell Mayhew Engineering at Edmonton in 1985 and has worked on PV system design, development, consulting, performance measurement and analysis, and PV standards development. He has been involved in 152 PV projects in BC, Alberta, and the Yukon and Northwest Territories. They are becoming larger and more challenging and diverse. He loves helping people understand solar PV and what it can do for them. This is his... 489th solar presentation. Over the years, he's worked with Alberta's government, electricity regulators, utilities, and municipalities to identify and eliminate the barriers to grid-connected solar PV systems in order to help Alberta get ready for inexpensive, wide-scale solar electricity. This time has now come. As a result of all our buildings and homes and electricity infrastructure need to be constructed to be PV ready at a minimum. Thank you very much, Rael. Um, can I have a show of hands here of who here has a solar electric system on their home or on their building? Great. Do you know what just happened yesterday? The city of Edmonton has produced these little signs called, I'm generating electricity and I'm generating change. And each of us that have a solar PV system can get one of these signs. If you want to call Leon Milner at the city, leon.milner at edmonton.ca, you can get one too. I put one up in my own house uh, earlier today. So just a plug for the city and the great stuff that this city of Edmonton is doing. So I was asked by Rob Harlan to take 10 minutes to talk about uh, perspectives of a designer and developer on a commercial solar PV system. So it's been really fascinating journey over the last 40 some years as I've worked in this. Uh, 40 years ago, people really didn't know how to spell the word. 
And uh, then I had this amazing opportunity in 1988 to measure the performance of 14 systems across Canada. One grid connected, the rest off grid. And that's where I learned how to, how to work with solar. And then Edmonton Power hired me in 1994 to put a solar PV system on my house. It was, it was the first one west of Toronto, which means it was the biggest one in Edmonton. And uh, it's 2.3 kilowatts, which is laughingly small these days. But it's been fascinating then learning uh, how to design PV systems on, on homes and then switching over to commercial. And right now I'm doing a, a lot of uh, school systems too, as well as, as well as large buildings. It's a completely different mindset. So I guess if I plug this. <clears throat> okay, I want to acknowledge that we are on the traditional lands of the Papas Chase people and the people of Treaty 6 and that I respect their spiritual relationship with these lands. I am a professional engineer. As I've said, I've been working since in solar since 77 and solar PV since 83. I design and supply and commission solar electric systems. I don't have any vested interest in any one particular technology. All I want as a professional engineer is that you make decisions with your eyes wide open so you can decide what's best for you. Uh, what I'm fascinated about is the world of solar electricity is growing incredibly crap rapidly. It's really hard to keep up. It's now becoming affordable for us in our everyday lives. Look at the number of people around here who in this room who have solar PV systems. There was a time when I was the only one that could put up their hand. <clears throat> and the, sunny, the time has now arrived for Alberta to harness another one of its abundant resources. Actually, if you take solar energy, we have 300 times more solar energy in the province than we pull all, from all of our coal, oil, gas, and bitumen throughout the whole year. 300 times more. So we're not an oil province. We're, in, we're a solar province. But the big question is, are we really ready for solar to become ubiquitous throughout the province? That's a big challenge. We've got a lot of work to be done, not related to technology at all, but related to relationships and territory and legal stuff and education and taking photos of all the systems, taking great photos so we can broadcast to everybody how great it looks and how great it works. So, I only have 10 minutes for this, so this is very brief. I've been asked to speak about the role of engineers, to do a little bit, to talk a little bit about commercial permits, to, I'll mention a little bit about relationship with EPCOR and with the uh, elec uh, electricity approvals. So, I'm fascinated that, the, here's a list of the 10 biggest PV systems in Edmonton, and you see how fast it's changing. The top three are literally only a year old. Um, the top six, well, I just scooted in the Alta Pro building about 10 minutes ago into my list, otherwise it would have been wrong, so thank you for that. Um, the Shaw Conference Center, number seven, I'm working on right now. It's going to have a 170 kilowatt system on it by about August next year, which is really hugely challenging. And then... Uh, you know, Gene Dubbs building. Has anybody seen Gene Dubbs building downtown? It's quite a fascinating skinny building on 104th Avenue. The university's putting in some, and there's a whole pile more that are coming along the lines, and this, day, this list is going to be out of date probably six months from now. So things are growing and changing uh, rapidly. It's fascinating to see what role an engineer has in life overall. When things happen for the first time in life, an engineer has to be involved because we have the uh, background and training in the physics, typically, in order to make th sure things are safe. And we take the professional responsibility and liability for that. And then once engineers do something quite a number of times, then the code comes along. The plumbing code, mechanical, uh, heating code, uh, structural, uh, building code, and electrical code they come along and then they take over the professional, the, the liability for doing things. So, and as a building and uh, safety codes officer told me yesterday, when I was asking him a bit about the city of Edmonton's permitting process, he said, in a few years it will be ho-hum and the regulations will be relaxed. 
Isn't that fun? Like, my guess is like five years. So right now, though, there are a lot of regulations that are pretty strict, and for good reason, because the regulatory authorities who do take responsibility for things, they are learning a lot. Solar's changing rapidly. So they are very concerned about the safety aspects to it, because if there's something that's unsafe, they are the ones that get blamed. So they're quite strict. Now, uh, a professional engineer or a professional engineering technologist, such as uh, Clifton, we can stamp plans and then we take the professional liability for the work that we do. Um, there's two main, for solar PV systems, there's two main areas in which uh, permitting is, is, safety permitting is required. One is the structural side of it, and that's carried by a structural engineer. And the city told me today that a structural engineering stamp is always required for a home PV system and is always required for a commercial PV system. Again, that's now, and that in a few years when they become more comfortable with it, they will relax their regulations. Once they understand that everybody's doing things right and then it'll get into the code and then they'll relax their regulations. Now, the structural engineering stamp, there's really three stamps that are required. One is on the equipment itself, so that's the racking equipment. The racking equipment, when they come from a, a supplier, it should already have an engineering stamp saying that that equipment is strong enough to bear the loads, on, the wind loads, the snow loads, and the uh, wind uplift loads, and the weight of the, equipment, of the solar modules and the equipment itself. And then there's another stamp that's required for attaching that equipment to the building. Very important. You can have the strongest racking system in the world, but if it isn't attached to the building, it'll fly off. I mean, if it isn't attached with weights or, or fasteners, it'll fly off. So that needs to be stamped too. And then the third stamp is the load, uh, is the building structure itself and how much weight it can carry. Again, in snow, the uh, structural part of the racking system and the wind uplift. Um, I'm not a structural engineer, I'm electrical. I always work with Andy Smith, a local structural engineer. I never do a PV system without his stamp on it. I find him extremely reasonable. Quite frankly, he teaches me all about the structural side. I don't want to take his job, but he teaches me about it. He tells me what to do on my drawings. I put them on my drawings, and then he reviews it, and then he stamps it. So it's a really good relationship. It's, it's not expensive at all. And then on the electrical engineering side, uh, for homes, uh, electrical engineer is not required for a PV system. It's always optional, of course. And for commercial, I'm fascinated that the people I've spoke to are not certain whether an electrical engineer is required on commercial systems. The closest I have found in talking to some colleagues and to the city is that it depends on how complex the uh, the electrical engineering is. Uh, some are saying whether it's, if it's over 240 volts, then you need electrical engineer. Others are saying if there's arc flash issues or complexity issues, how big the generating capacity is, etc. I mean, you would never get a big building built with, uh, designed without an electrical engineer. But where the threshold is between, between whether you need one or not, I haven't found that out yet. And if anybody else knows, I certainly welcome your comments. So what I do as an electrical engineer on my projects, I design them and develop them. There's, it seems like a lot of people really don't understand what that functionally means. Development, from my perspective, is working with the clients. I want to find out what your goals are, what your budgets are, and what your preferences are. And then I get your electricity bills, incredibly important, as others have said, and I analyze the heck out of them. I create all these wonderful spreadsheets and tables and graphs. Quit laughing. I post them on Facebook. They're great. If you want me, I can send you a copy of, of them. There's one gentleman in Sherwood Park. He sends me his, his uh, utility bill for his house regularly every month for the last three years. 
and I uh, analyze the heck out of it and send it back to them. But it's really good because then I find out exactly what the price of electricity is and how it's going up or going down or, or changing. And then from that we can do the economic analysis properly. Development is also about getting the municipal building, uh, the municipal permit, so that's uh, development permit, building permit, and the electricians get the electrical permit, and then getting the regulatory approvals from the electricity company. Then the design part is getting the drawings for the building, uh, calculating how much energy it's going to generate, using modeling software, knowing the surface area of the building, the surface area of the, of the solar modules, and don't just think of putting it on the roof, put it on walls, put it on the south wall first, and when you run out of room on the south wall, wall, you put it on the east or west wall, and when you run out of the roof, the south wall, the east wall, and the west wall, where else do you put it? Ground mount, yes. Parking canopies, yep, absolutely. And where else? Facing north. Don't ever forget putting it facing north. It's not the best place to put it, but if you run out of room, absolutely put it facing north. I've got some wonderful examples of north-facing PV. And I'm talking about Canada north-facing. I'm not talking about Australia north-facing. That's different. It doesn't generate as much as everywhere else. Of course not. But if you are wanting to meet your energy budget, absolutely don't forget north. And then we look at the tilt angle, the orientation angle, the building alternating current voltage. We look at what it looks like. We look at the structural attachments, the electrical connections. Uh, and we choose the modules, the racking, the inverters, the cabling, the disconnects, and then we provide stamped structural electrical drawings. All those things go into what's called design from an engineering viewpoint. Uh, has anybody heard of schedules? Yes. I've only ever had to sign schedules three times, but typically when an and engineers required on a project, we have to fill out these forms called schedules. And there's A schedules, B schedules, and C schedules that form a, com a commitment that the owner has to hire professionals and that the professional has to design it properly and inspect it because we act as the inspectors for our work. It's one thing to make our drawings, but then we have to go to site and make sure that the, that the installers install, where's the other one, oh, both of you, uh, install it according to our drawings because that's the contract, our drawings form part of the contract. You install it the way I want it to install. And if you don't like the way I, in, I have designed it, what do you do? Communicate. Gordon, this is crazy, you can't do that. Or. Gordon, I got a way better product in a much cheaper price that you didn't know about. Can I use this? Tell me. And then I'll go and do my calculations again, and I'll say, fantastic. Great. Thank you for offering the client better product than I knew about. Absolutely. So the key, a lot of installers, unfortunately, complain about the city. And I think that's unfair. The city has a really, really important role to make sure things are safe in life. You may say, oh, well, it's my building. I can do whatever the heck. No. Some point in time, you're going to be pushing up the daisies, and somebody else is going to be owning your building. And they need to rely on the city making sure that the solar system is safe on your building so that when they are there, they can operate your building with peace of mind. So. This, the city is around for hundreds of years, we are not. So that's why these safety codes and the Safety Codes Act are really important. So it covers all work that's covered by the building code or by the electrical code. The development permit is a relationship function. How does it look? Is it going to squish my neighbor's properties or overhang things or cause them shading or whatever? And then the other two, building and electrical, those are safety functions. Again, I mentioned the PV technologies are rapidly changing, and I pity the electrical inspectors uh, and the building inspectors in trying to keep up with it. I know for me, I don't know about the installers, but I know for me that it's a hard time keeping up with all the changes that are happening. 
I personally think the city is doing a great work in being a leader. They're working to streamline their permitting processes. They're working to adapt to the changing technologies. And there's a huge number of growing systems. So no longer can the city say, oh, you know, solar, I mean, nobody wants to get into it. I think there's probably 800 systems in the city now. Um, and they're having to adjust their own processes. I've had some fights with the city, absolutely. Um, and uh, I've had fights on uh, development side, and I've had fights on the electrical side. I'm not sure if I've had any fights on the structural side, but um, I want to respect that they are changing and, and adapting as, as are we all. The key to development permits for anybody doing development permit work is to get to know the development permit officers. I am very impressed at how if you tell them that a big project is coming along, they start to get really, really excited about your project. They get to, to think about it when you're not talking to them. They'll phone you up and say, hey, make sure you do this and this and this. And like I even had for the Simons project at Londonderry Mall, I even had the development officer say, make sure you tell me the moment you take your plans down to the city and submit them because I want to grab those plans and I want to work on them myself. And with that, he got our development permit done in a week. Fantastic. That's amazing. But I had, given, I had walked him through the journey of this for a couple of months so that he knew it was coming down the line and he was prepared for it. The other thing to really, it's really important for engineers to know the bylaws. Oh my goodness. How can you design a thing? How can you advise your clients if you don't know the bylaws? Especially the height one, of course, and the setbacks and neighborhood overlays and things like that. And I'm fascinated that if, if you know the bylaw, keep in mind that a bylaw is a law and the development officer has to interpret it just like you have to interpret it. And so if you know it, and they say no, and you think it's yes, then you can stand up to them. And that's happened to me a couple of times too, which is really important. And then if you stand up to them, respectfully and honorably, of course, then they go to their superiors and talk about it. And, well, I've had them come back and say, yeah, well, you're right, okay, we'll let your, your system go ahead. Which is really important because I designed it, so I hope I know what I'm doing. The building permit governed by the Alberta Building Code, again, know the building code so that if the building officer says no and you disagree with them or her, you can have some kind of discussion and come to a resolution instead of just having your project turned down. And the electrical code, oh my goodness. Uh, it's the same thing with the electrical code. Know your electrical code so that if they say no, and look, uh, Clifton uh, alluded to the rodent protection one. Because of the Simons PV system, we have now uh, got a standata written for the whole province so that no longer is rodent protection needed on any PV system in the province, period, because the electrical code was actually written so ineptly that uh, when you read it and analyze it, you realize they don't know what, the code doesn't know what it's talking about, and so rodent protection is not needed on the wires. It was a, it was a huge amount of effort. I think it took me 160 hours worth of my professional time to get this, uh, to get this analyzed and presented. But the key is, is that know the electrical code inside and out, and then you can get your project done hopefully the way you want, <laughs> maybe. Uh, grid connection. So the key here is that the Electric Utilities Act in Alberta governs the generation of all electricity, except for garden lights. I've tried to prove that the garden lights were governed by it too, but the Ut Utilities Commission wouldn't hear that from me. Uh, the Electric Utilities Act is implemented through Rule 7, and then the microgeneration is underneath the Electric Utilities Act. It's for special conditions. And if you're a PV professional, you have to know this regulation. I am very disappointed the number of times that people come to me 
and uh, they don't know the regulation. You have no excuses. You have to know it. It's really easy to read. It's not long to read. Same thing with Rule 24, which is the rule that the AUC uses to implement the microgen regulation. No excuses, you have to know it. And with that, then you can use it to your advantage. Getting, uh, keeping in mind that you're connecting your PV system to the building, which is connected to the grid, keep Edmonton distribution and transmission informed about your work. They, have to, they are charged to own and operate and maintain a reliable electricity system for us all. So they are not going to allow any crap onto their system. And they, again, are struggling to, to accommodate all the PV that's happening, in both with handling by their staff and uh, a number of uh, power quality issues that they have to accommodate. And this is just isn't EPCOR. This is all the wire companies around the province. So if you put a PV system more than 20 kilowatts on your building, contact EPCOR right away and let them know that that's what you're doing. And if it's more than 250 kilowatts, as of the beginning of, I guess it was this year, isn't it? Uh, yeah. Um, they have special protection requirements and uh, what are called visibility requirements on, on systems that are more than 250 kilowatts AC. Not these. They're very strongly supporting PV, as, as, as is the city too, and they will become your friend if you communicate with them well. That's what I have found. Although I've had my fights with all the wire companies. I usually win. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, uh, Clifton, I have a question. The picture that you had, the building in the top left where the could you explain what was happening there? Was it moving in that picture? Like had it lifted up or fallen down? So, <clears throat> excuse me. So the majority of it had, it had been, okay, yeah, it had collapsed basically. But originally it was all elevated up at a, and facing south and then, and it fell. Except for the one side which had fallen on some cell phone tower devices, I believe. So, yeah. It'd be interesting to know, like, I haven't seen any publications or any reports on what actually the rooted, made the root cause of that, but yeah, it's pretty, pretty graphic. I think it's worth noting maybe, too, that uh, that was Ontario, correct? Yeah, yeah so, Ontario. And, uh, and Ontario had a, a huge kind of boom in solar kind of starting in 2010, and so I think you saw a lot of installations, and uh, for the most part, I would say probably following best practices, but you do find those type of um, one-offs. Hopefully they're one-offs because that's a, that's a pretty dangerous position to be putting uh, anybody in, especially, you know, that was a, that looked like a, um, a, a, a condo building or something like that. So there's a lot of people around. So anyway, but, you know, learning, you know, learning curve and, you know, uh, make sure like Gordon was saying, oh yeah, he's shaking his head because he said they just pro probably didn't follow proper engineering, right? Oh, uh, well. So what you want to say? Well, I mean, that's a good point. Um, I talked to colleagues in Ontario about that project, and they said that as soon as they saw it put up, everybody just shook their head thinking, oh, oh there's trouble starting to happen here. Um, but you see, again, the engineer designs it, hopefully correctly. The installer installs it, hopefully correctly. But the engineer's job is also to inspect what the installer did. So if the installer did take shortcuts, the engineer is required to find that out. So I haven't seen what the accident investigation report would, would be like, but uh, I would think that that engineer is sweating bricks. It's a good question. There's another one down over there. I've got a couple of questions. Uh, the first is, where did you get this 2% rate of financing that you came up with? Uh, who offered that to you? Uh, so that came from NMAX. Uh, that's what the, any NMAX dealer in Alberta, they offer fixed financing for 15 years up to 20 years, uh, anywhere from two down to one and a half percent actually, so very good financing rates through those guys. Okay, that's good. Yep. Um, in, question for engineers, as when it came from the architectural background, I'm a project manager, it seems you're, you're missing a gap, you guys, with having an architect do some of the initial design work and then overseeing the various engineers. That's, that's customary how you do with a building. And this industry seems to have evolved where you've eliminated that and you've got your electrical engineer, your structural engineer. You seem to be in a void or a little void or something like I'm 
sort of sensing that where you haven't got somebody in control, which is what we're used to. Um, and so it's just a question I bring up because I'm fairly new to this and it kind of hit me between the eyes. My dad's an architect, so <laughs> I guess I'm protected, but still. Sure, and, and thank you for mentioning that, absolutely. Well, uh, the, the schools and buildings that I'm working on do have architects running the projects, absolutely. Um, but they're usually like a school, a new school, so there's the design of that, and then there's a modernization of the school, so there's the design of that. So that, those projects are much more than just PV. But when a client comes to me and just wants a PV system on, I have to be open with you. I had never even thought about saying, should an architect be involved? Because I know how to design it uh, electrically, I get Andy Smith to design it structurally, and and uh, then I go out and ask for bids from installers and, and, and do it that way. But thank you for the, your comments about the architects. Well, I bring that up because in, in one building I'm looking at doing, I have to uh, go to a flat roof and I'm going to put a truss in, half truss in to, to maximize the solar. So I'm changing the, the design of the building, which is an important aspect of it visually and looking at it down the road. You I'm, need an architect. Well, it's... It, sure. Well, yeah, yeah, it doesn't. I mean, yeah, I, I'd be used to that. I would be expected sure. it. So, you sure. know, it's just it's something you think about. And was, we all have our areas of expertise, you know, and, and with all due respect, you know what I'm saying? I just see that. It's just like that Holmes and Holmes. He seems to do everything when he's a trade, and with all due respect to trades, yeah. I, I, I see him so going, going so far beyond yeah. his boundary of expertise. It's, it, it scares me, and I, I have concerns over missing out some of the, these important, yeah. I mean, experts or or. I guess areas as, as this industry develops, if you don't yeah. do it, you end up with some ugly looking stuff or stuff that doesn't work that, you know, otherwise would have been yeah. picked up. Yeah, totally agree with you and thank you for that. Yeah, if it would, if some, a client came to me and wanted me to do a PV system where it got beyond my skills, I mean, I'm required by law as an engineer, of course, to know my limits, so I'd bring in somebody else. Um, I got in trouble once at an architect's conference, though I said to the architects, uh, I said to the architects, you guys make it look pretty, but you don't care how it works. I make it work, and I don't care what it looks like. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't like that. <laughs> Do we have uh, any other questions? Jason, over there, yeah. Gordon, this question's actually for you. Um, in regards to the microgen regulation and overproduction, and specifically about the Alts Pro shop, I'd be curious what your thoughts are on generating 200,000 in a year when they utilize, what was it, 136 a year? Yeah. Something like that? What are your thoughts on that? I love it. <laughs> Epcor is a great wire company. Um, so I have two responses actually. I'd really love to know how AltaPro, if AltaPro had any uh, questions from EPCOR about uh, generating, what was it, something like 50% more than you consume. I, I, there, in my view there's ways of getting around that, but I'd like to know what AltaPro did. So from our standpoint, it was, uh, it's very hard to predict what tenant you have in your building and what your load is. So we have a couple tenants that were in and out and we had some statistical data and we were able to show them that we, you know, this is a load that we need to have and they were okay with it. They, they approved it. So it was a, you know, a back and forth trying to get it approved. But you know, like you said, it's made us very happy that we can get a system that we can actually produce electricity. You know, it, it'd, it'd be a shame if we got a net zero building and then got a tenant in there that has a very large load and then all of a sudden we become not electrically net zero. So they understood that and they worked well with us and uh, they were happy to approve it. So. And sorry, quick question Dave, while I have the mic there, is the single meter thing, could you explain that a little better? Yeah, so uh, our electrical distribution existing used to have a, a meter for tenant one, two, three and our house panel. So we ended up pulling off that main distribution and putting in one meter for the entire building. So now all of our tenants, uh, they don't pay for their electrical bills month by month. They don't get a bill from EPCOR it is now included in their lease rates. So we effectively erased all the meters in the building and made one big one. And, right. and that's a really significant uh, action that you've taken because I have heard other people say 
that we're not allowed to resell electricity. I haven't seen a rule that prohibits that, quite frankly. Um, but I know some people have paused because they they felt that we couldn't that like you couldn't resell it. I'm not trying to challenge you. Uh, what I'm fascinated about, though, is that lots of shopping centers they resell electricity to their people in the shopping centers. So why can't an apartment building owner do similar to what you guys have done and re and just have one meter for the apartment building? and have a big PV system on that would supply electricity for the whole building and the, and the tenants and the common areas and do it that way. So, however, your question was also about uh, over-generation. Um, at Coelectric challenged a colleague of ours in, who put a PV system in at Bonneville, and the, uh, the house was generating, the PV system would be generating about 30% more per year. Than the, than the present consumption, and the homeowner had plans to increase his consumption by putting in a workshop and buying a Tesla Model 3 electric car, but he wouldn't be doing that for a couple of years. So Atco said, no, you can't do that. Now keep in mind a wire company cannot say no, they can only say yes or dispute it to the AUC. So they did dispute it to the AUC, and uh, that was in March, and just, uh, I think, mid-August, we found out that we had actually lost that case. Um, but it's really easy to get around it, uh, because what the installer did was he had 34 PV modules. He covered up eight with cardboard, strong, uh, securely fastened with painter's tape so that the wind and the rain wouldn't blow the cardboard away. And... Uh, then, then the PV system wouldn't generate the 30% more. And then what we're doing is we're getting uh, two 1,500-watt electric heaters and running them 24 hours a day for two months. That'll cost them about $500 worth of electricity minus about $100 worth of methane gas he wouldn't buy. So three months from now, he will have used his 30%, and then he can take off the uh, solar PV modules. And the key about that is the eight... PV modules is worth about $2,400 from Energy Efficiency Alberta. So by paying $400, you get an extra $2,400 back. So, I, you know, and it meets the it meets the law, meets the microgen regulation just properly. Awesome. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, can I, well, on that note, uh, kind of we were talking about having multi-tenant, um, you know, was an apartment building or whatnot and, and selling your electricity. So, Clifton, you talked about Fort McMurray, a 600 and some kilowatt mm -hmm. job. Was that a condo building? Was that an apartment building? And were there like more meters there or was it just one meter? And how did that maybe come about? Yeah, so it was a condo building, condo complex, four separate buildings. Uh, there, we basically were offsetting their, their common loads. Uh, we weren't getting into the individual units which were metered. Um, I know it's it seems to be a really tough uh, tough to break into that and I don't know if it's maybe because it was commercial but um, Brentwood Apartments uh, probably about six years ago uh, their low income housing they wanted to have one meter so they could put enough solar on to cover everybody and were denied so I, I think it's a bit of a grey area out there right now or at least we've got to dig more into the rules to find out where the dividing line is for having one meter for multiple tenants, because uh, man, I'd love to see just more, more multi-tenant of because it just it really helps the economics of solar. And yeah, and sounds like it could really push forward. Yeah. Yeah, Other yeah, questions? Yeah, sure. Guy, yeah. you got one there? Yeah, uh, uh, two two questions here. The first one here, since we were working on Dave there, uh, with Alpha Pro on uh, <laughs> uh, on your other uh, uh, clients in the building, are you guys doing a monitoring of their power consumption then through each power panel then yeah. on this type of system? Yeah, so in, in addition to deleting their meters, we put in our own uh, sub-metering so we could still monitor their, their consumption and uh, understand their loads. We didn't want to go blind to their consumption. Cause yeah, so that if you end up with a manufacturing outfit or whatever that was a exactly. machine shop that would uh, burn more power than anybody else but not have to pay any more. 
Yeah, that was one of our first things we thought about. Like, nope, we got to protect ourselves that way too. So. Okay. Uh, my other question is for Robert and one with their uh, IKEA now having a, a big system here in, uh, in Edmonton and that. Uh, this, I understood that you had mentioned that uh, your system was going to be overproducing right off the bat. Is that correct? Uh, I, I wouldn't go that far. Um, let's, we'll, we're we're kind of yet to see what we'll, what it'll, it'll be producing at. Um, uh, shoot me an email. I'll get back to you on those details. Okay. Right. <laughs> so that's it. Uh, until they can get it all running, one on deal. Uh, we'll we'll probably hear more about it then in yeah, the future. Yeah, we'll, we'll have details coming soon once we're 100 percent up and running. Great. But thank yeah. you. Yeah, yeah we got just some just Ron, just you, oh, just yeah. just on this. Okay. Um, uh, you told me that a building is typically uses 400 house houses worth, uh, roughly. Yeah, it's, I believe. Our, our store 41,000 I think yeah, is what it was, it was around 400 house ha households mm -hmm. worth of energy is used oh. per, per per store per store and the, oh. our solar array s sets to offset about 100 households so. oh okay so with that with that now I was going to do some other calculations but with that number he's uh, he's getting 25 percent of his energy from the sun so not over generation at all Thanks. yes that is a calculator that Gordon just pulled out <laughs> in the pot. It doesn't go anywhere without it. Ron, did you have a question there? You... Yeah, for somebody that's just uh, considering putting in solar, uh, where do you see the uh, technology going as far as the output from a solar panel? Because I see they're going from 250 and the latest one is 400 that IKEA has. Uh, where, where do you see that going in the next couple of years? And should a guy hold off until it gets better if you have a small roof? Well, and uh, my second question is, if you have a new building, how do you calculate what uh, capacity of solar you c are allowed to put in? Like, who does that calculation? Okay. So if I put incandescent lights in, you calculate on that basis and then upgrade later. Is that the idea? Or? So in terms of the solar module uh, advancement, it, it's actually a very slow creep. Uh, there's not leaps and bounds that you see on the modules. Uh, it's more of a marketing thing where the, the modules, they get, they get bigger in size, so the actual efficiencies of the cells are, are they're improving, but not year over year leaps and bounds. It's just the, the, like the 400 watt module we had is a lot bigger than the other ones. So the, the density is a little bit better, but um, you know, you're not going to be missing out on like a, you buy a cell phone or get a new Windows 10 and then the next year there's something else way better the next year. It, uh, in terms of PV, it's very, it's very linear and not as, as fast as it seems. Um, what was the second question again? This was about the... Sizing. And the sizing. So that will come from your, your, either your engineering or your PV contractor. You know, they'll assess your roof, they'll look at your solar access, and they'll tell you what you can fit on your roof and how much it's going to generate for you. It'll be part of their, their process. Um, so I, I, I thank you for your, your comments. It is fascinating to see. The PV modules in my house are 10.8% efficient, and now regularly the 400-watt ones are 19.3, and we're still using 17.5, 18.5, but more commonly it's 18.5 to 19-something. But there are 22% efficient modules now that are coming down the line. National Solar has, what is it, 365, 60-watt modules? I mean, that's... 60 cell, they, that's crazy, 22%. And it's not sun power, so we can actually get them in Edmonton uh, through a decent dealer too. But they are very expensive right now. But typically they seem to go up five watts or so every year. So maybe, you know, with Nationals pr pricing and everything, maybe, what, two years from now, they'll be, they'll be the standard modules. That would be my guess. Um, but PV right now is somewhat like computers in the 90s. Like, if you're going to wait to get the best one, you'll wait 100 years. And if you want one now, well, get it now. Because if you did it next year, there's always something better after that. So you'll always end up waiting. The, the other question was on how do you calculate the energy consumption of a building before it's built? I think your question was? Yeah. Um, well, I'm an engineer, and so I'm a, I have to be truthful and everything. I can't cheat. 
But I would go to, like if it was a school or an office building or a warehouse, I'd go and look at standard ASHRAE uh, energy consumption numbers and use those. And if it's going to be energy efficient, then you'd, you'd knock it off a little bit. But uh, you could also hire an energy modeler, like uh, Smith & Anderson has their division called Footprint in Toronto that does energy modeling. I think WSP in Edmonton might have some. So you can get some energy modelers that would, would would do uh, what the building would use, both on methane, gas, and electricity, and and base it on that. So, before we move on, I was surprised nobody brought up the concept of bifacial modules, especially in kind of a commercial setting. So, what you've probably been hearing about mainly is like a monofacial, just the front side produces. Um, so, LG, you know, as you guys know, they've got. We've got about a 390 watt bifacial module. So essentially where there was a white back sheet not allowing any light to go through, is now they've replaced it with a clear back sheet. Now you get the, um, you get the light passing through the module, but you also pick up the reflection on the back side of it. So you'll have 390 watt on the front and then, you know, I mean, I know their marketing people say that it's probably about 80% on the back side. I don't really believe it, but. Um, it it kind of all depends on what your what your roof surface is too, right? If it's painted white and you're getting really good um, reflection, then then it can kind of uh, work out. So those are kind of some of the the advancements you see, and I think there's a good use for them in commercial type buildings as well, as um, you know, ground mounts are another really good um, use for a bifacial module. So it is interesting. I mean, um, it hasn't really caught on a lot, but. Uh, I know that they're out there and LG does mm -hmm. push, you know, on a regular basis that, uh, that people should be using them. So it's a good forum to talk about it anyway. We use bifacial modules on the parking canopy at Londonderry Mall at the La Maison Simon store. And um, the rating on them was about 10% for the backside. But as you point out, it depends on the reflection of the surface. But how many have ever, ever seen a, an old white roof? like? Okay, it's white for the first year, and then after that, it's more like gray and dirty and all that stuff. So I think bifacial is great, but I think we need a lot more experience with it before we really understand how much more it gets over the year. Okay, so I have a question for Clifton. Uh, you had mentioned um, standing seam roof is your preference for, a, let's say, a subroof. This is a, as much an architectural question as anything. Um, and you didn't really get to that as far as I could hear. You're going to make that recommendation and some reason why you chose this standing seam system. Okay. Okay. Uh, so it basically comes to how it holds the system down. Uh, on a ballasted system, you've usually got concrete blocks uh, holding everything down. Um, you know, moving that around takes time, takes effort, adds expense as well just for the concrete blocks alone. But when you, when you have a standing seam metal roof, and you're able to just strictly clamp right to the structure of the roof, uh, you remove the need for any ballast. And you can basically, at that point, just adhere right to the roofing structure. And that becomes a, a real backbone of your system as well, the roofing structure. And so any wind loading, any, any of that isn't, uh, it, it's covered. So basically, you're really saving on the ballast. So from, uh, instead of, I guess, I think, just to throw it out there roughly, I bet you it saves probably 15% on labor, 10 or 15%, which is yep. you know pretty substantial. Probably helps with the uh, structural stamps as well, you know, not having that much weight on there. Right? Yeah, yeah, and it knocks down your, your weight as well because uh, ballasted system, you can get that to be probably five, six pounds a square foot, um, whereas just a, a straight standing seam metal roof you're you're just looking at probably right around three or under so uh, structural engineers are a lot happier for sure thank you thank you and then the installers don't have to lug 20,000 pounds of concrete blocks from one end of the roof to the other there's, there's one up there. Up there. two up there I promise this guy right here okay Sorry. did you okay go ahead so in considering putting a uh, a solar system in a residential house, it seems like the fastest way you could probably get it paid off and increasing your return on investment is to get off the grid. 
to get off the transmission and distribution charges. So what kind of technology is there, is there right now from a reliability standpoint on both battery systems and backup generators? Like, what would you guys recommend? Stay on the grid. <laughs> like, in, are you in Edmonton or St. Albert? Let's say i um, building a property in the middle of nowhere. Oh, well, if you're more than a couple of kilometers from the power line, then the electrical lines, then fine, go off the grid. But if you're in the city, it's only costing you 300 bucks a year to connect to the grid. And if you put in an off-grid PV system, it's going to be about four times bigger and more expensive than a grid-connected system. And you're going to have a $15,000 battery bank that you need to replace in 15 years. That means it's equivalent to $1,000 a year to replace the battery bank so that you can save $300 a year on your distribution transmission fees. Like why? So the, the technology on batteries just isn't up to par, and are, are, are they? Well, making but just no, 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 no. It's not that at all. It's that in a grid, in an off-grid system, you design it for the worst two weeks in December. I don't care how much storage you have. You you design it for the worst two weeks in December, and then the whole rest of the year, this PV system is way oversized. Where, like, you would need a 20 to 24 kilowatt PV system to go off grid on, a, on an average homeowner in Alberta. And if you stay on the grid, you'll need a 6 kilowatt. So, so your system's way oversized if you go off grid. I don't care what your storage is like. Well, it sounds like the, the technology is where it needs to be. Yeah. It's just a matter of how much money do you want to put forward. And then really kind of what kind of uh, payback are you really looking at? I, no, that's yeah. yeah, like the technology, the equipment, it's, it is all there. Uh, the economics, I mean, if you're looking at bringing, you know, power lines in for forty, fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 and then having have that expense, you know, of having the grid paid every month, yeah, the economic case is there for sure to do that. Um, it's not easy. Um, the biggest failures you see in, in honestly, in off-grid is not the equipment, it's the way it's installed. There's some really bad off-grid out there. Um, it's um, it's usually you know batteries. People are scrimp out on batteries or something like that. So I mean, it's you can go off-grid. It's fine. Um, battery storage. Do, the costs do need to come down uh, for sure to really get the economics going on it. Um, lithium is dropping. I think you can get it for under now. We've seen it for un, you know about 850 bucks a kilowatt hour. Um, whereas before, I think it was probably closer to 2,000, 2,500. So uh, it's call it kind of following the same route as what solar modules have done or have, well, they've stopped now, but did for probably that five year window between 2000 and uh, what was that? Probably 2009 and 2014, mm -hmm. those big drops. <coughs> does that help kind of answer? I think it, yeah, it does. At least get the conversation. But. I had this kind of conversation with Gordon, I think, a few years ago, and uh, it was good, and we, we had a, a, a pretty good, uh, well, I guess I just got lectured on it, but uh, <laughs> it worked out really well. But the idea behind it was we've got a wonderful electric grid, and, uh, and there's kind of a cost to maintaining that. And, and I guess we maybe take it for granted how reliable it is and, and how good it is. So you're trying to offset costs. I think, you know, Clifton brought up the idea you know, if you've got an initial investment for, you know, because you, you're bringing it, you know, however many kil kilometers from, from the main line, then, you know, then you have a, an actual kind of a story to tell. But, you know, beyond that, I, you know, it's kind of hard to make that work, uh, you know, to, to actually move yourself off grid. Just pure financially, I, I wouldn't, I mean, I, I would hesitate, unless you've got a lot of money and you want to do it, that, that's good too. <laughs> Um, the, the other thing I think that is useful to keep in mind is that when you're connected to the grid, you're not maintaining the grid. You have access to 100 or 500 employees who go out there in the worst of weathers and maintain the grid and make it work again when, during an electrical outage or a thunderstorm or squirrels and all that kind of stuff. When you're off grid, how many employees do you have at your beck and call to maintain your electricity system? One. And it's you. 
And when is the system going to fail? It's at the worst possible time. And the worst possible time is minus 40, December, just before Christmas. The Kirk turkey is cooking, and you're away, and your wife is home, alone, and pregnant. So... <laughs> So I think the value of 300 bucks a year is pretty understated too. And there's probably something to, to, to be said about having storage added to a PV system for that inevitable power outage, but it might be for a day or two exactly. days worth of autonomy. And, and that's something, that's a trend that we're, we're starting to see quite a lot of. And in other markets in the world, uh, California is a big one, Ontario is another one, Germany is another one. But you see a lot of... Uh, a lot of people that are installing batteries and, and actually have to install batteries when they install a PV system. And it, it kind of starts to make sense, right? Because there's time of use metering. So, you know, if you're, if you're pulling um, at a particular time in the day, um, you'll get charged the, the exorbitant rates. Whereas if you can, you know, wait until later on, you might be able to shave that. So that's where you're starting to see some, some uh, smart storage kick in. Um, Anyway, uh, but let's move on to another question. Uh, one, one sec, Grant. I think Sackett had uh, one Just question. to add on a little bit to this discussion, uh, is there a battery life uh, generally in the range of, what, seven to eight years? So that, that is, again, a recurring cost that you have to keep in mind, right, while installing batteries? Yeah, I think Gordon was mentioning kind of 15 years. You know, there's usually seven to 10 year warranties. If you look after your battery bank extremely well, you could get 15 to 20 years out of it. But if you do like a regular homeowner, who here changes their furnace fan filter? Yeah. Oh, I don't. Um, then you could wear out your batteries in five years easy. So, yeah, I, things are going to change radically. I, I never want to say never. I'm thrilled with what's happening with electric cars and how that battery technology will come and maybe in 10 years, 20 years, uh, I would be totally wrong. You should go off grid in, even in the city, but I uh, can't see it. Right. Oh, my, Grant had one question. First. Real, my question was different actually. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, so my question is for Clifton actually. Um, can you talk a little bit, uh, little bit more about the uh, harmonic distortions uh, through LEDs? And uh, so would you uh, suggest uh, the homeowners and the building owners not to go LED uh, if, if they want to go with solar? No, I, I think uh, basically you gotta look at the quality of the LED that you're, you're putting in. Uh, and it's gotta be on a pretty large scale. So homeowners, you know, on, on a residential scale, I, I don't think it's, it's much of a concern in the, in the loads that they're, you know, might be affected by harmonics in there are pretty limited, uh, furnace fan, you know, refrigerator, motor, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Computer, yeah. Um, so um, just when you're doing the retrofits, just, you know, you got to make sure you got good quality equipment going in there. And I think the new stuff that's in there, that's going in now, is much improved over the old stock. Uh, so it's probably not the problem it once was. But when you change, you know, a couple thousand light bulbs to LED, yeah, you, you probably want to watch what you're throwing in there. How, so how did you mitigate that? So... I mean, how did you get? But well, we actually work? had to pull out our transformers and put in a different style. Um, what's that? Uh, oh, that, well, I don't want to see where it was. I don't know what the client would, but the client was really good in understanding, uh, and it probably took about six months of us to, you know, to narrow it down. But at the end of the day, it was a chicken and the egg scenario: was the harmonics there before us, or were they after us? Um, and so. Yeah, so basically what we ended up doing is just replacing, switching out, figuring out that it was most likely coming from the transformers and replaced them out, and then it, it, it's been fine ever since. But what was strange about that is it operated fine for about two months, and then there was an event on the, on the grid, and after that it just seemed like the stability went in the whole system. So um, went from being an awesome story to being a bit of a hiccup, and then, but it's a good story now again, so everybody's happy. What kind of building, though? Uh, it was a rec center, okay. recreation center. Thank you. Uh, yeah, Grant? Yeah. Get a mic first. Yeah. 
Well, let this other gentleman go first, actually. So, uh, granted, we'll just we'll come back to that. Okay, yeah, I'll pass this down when I'm done. Um, let's see. Uh, the sh should be the the quick question, um, Gordon. You um, mentioned that you'd had you've been monitoring a uh, a home system from another client for about three years. He's sending you uh, his bills. Um, I heard the uh, a, I think it was uh, it was Dave throughout uh, about a ten percent transmission and distribution uh, reduction on the bills. Would you say that's that's been reflected in, uh, in in systems that you've you've seen monitored. Just just the cost of transmission and distribution um, after installing the solar. Uh, so the the bills that I'm analyzing from Sherwood Park, the guy doesn't have a PV system at all. Um, but typically on a on a typical home, whatever that means, uh, sixty percent of the electrical energy from the PV system is exported. And that could range from 50 to 90, but mm -hmm. 60 nominally. So that means the transmission and distribution energy costs would go down by 40%. But for transmission, it's only based on energy. And for distribution costs, it's based on energy and time. And of course, the time charges don't change at all. Okay. Um, but so the time charges in Edmonton are uh, for distribution and transmission, they are $237 a year or something like that, plus $60 a year for billing admin. And then the, uh, tra the distribution and transmission energy charges in Edmonton are 5.51 cents a kilowatt hour. So it would be the 5.51 that's reduced by 40% or so, and then the $300 a year doesn't change. Okay. But I, I'm happy to get you tons of numbers if you want <laughs> and so you <laughs> can help help you understand it I'm just basically looking for one the one of those um, you know not this is not power this is an, a kind of a a system maintenance thing uh, I'm just kind of curious how much on average uh, that's reduced by installing a PV system for distribution transmission yes now in a home or a commercial uh, let's say home Okay, because I'm more familiar with home and commercial gets into demand charges and, mm. and, and, and it gets very, very complicated. So your question is, how much does the distribution transmission get reduced in a home? Yes. Oh, well, the oh, energy okay. charge will go down by 40% and the, and the um, a time charge won't change. Now, just hang on, just hang on, just hang on. Oh, not the calculator. Um, the, on an average homeowner in Edmonton, their bill is, I think, in the order of 1300 bucks a year. Uh, and then the distribution and transmission would be, yeah, about, the, sorry, the time-based charges would be about 10% of that, and that doesn't change at all. Okay. Sorry, 30% uh, of that, and that doesn't change at all. Okay. Um, the other, that was supposed to be the quick question. The slightly longer one is for David. Um, how do you go about marketing to, uh, to commercial, uh, potential uh, commercial clients who are leasing uh, space, like basically your, your tenants, I suppose? Uh, is it possible to market to them or do you have to market to the building owner, the landlord? Yeah, it's, it's always a sticky one because there's a, a lot of clients who, who rent a space and they want solar, but at the end of the day, they're trying to put an asset on top of, the, the building that's not there so uh, it's always been a tough conversation because you have to involve the the land land the landlord on that one and the question always comes what happens when you leave the space you know does that system go with you and, and the implications that come up there so uh, we don't see a lot of systems go forward with someone who's leasing a system to put it on a building just because of the particulars um, but I, I do think it would be beneficial to maybe talk to the landlord about putting one on for themselves because then it's uh, it stays with the system so w we we don't really approach or advertise it too much just because we know it's a very large hurdle to get over uh, I wish it was a lot easier to be honest because there's there's a lot of people who rent space and, and lease space in Edmonton and I'd love to be able to crack that down but it, it, it'll come down to um, how you structure your lease and who owns that asset after you leave so we've got uh not very much time left, so we're going to do two more questions. Um, so I know, Grant, you had your hand up before. Did you want to go again? You'll need a mic, but... Oh, you got one. Okay. They've got to be good questions, hello, hello. too, by the way. <laughs> so just oh, yeah, this is, uh, this is 
talking to the fellow that asked when putting up a new building, how much solar can he put on? And Gordon had a very beautiful, great answer, very engineering and complicated. The simple answer is you call your utility up and you say, I'm building a thousand square foot building and how much solar can I put on? And they'll say, they'll walk you through it or your installer, they'll walk you through it and they'll say, well, it's residential, they got ballpark figures. And that'll start you off with a ballpark figure. And then your installer will, will say, well, yeah, but these guys got a welder and these guys got this and you massage it. But that gets you your original ballpark number. Yeah, but that's, that's the question you're asking. Okay, yeah, but, but this is all discussable. But that gets you your ballpark for a brand new building. Yeah. Okay, and then after that you go to roof space and all the other things that weren't discussed before. Is that fine? Thanks, Diaz. Thanks, Ray. Yep, yeah, that's good. Uh, one last one. We already heard from you, sorry, so we're going to have to go to this gentleman. And, but you, you'll have time after maybe to talk with some folks too, so. Uh, yeah, my question is, is, is the reluctance to allow you to overgenerate, uh, is that based on the capacity of the current system? What, what, what's the reason why they won't let you do that? Um, the Electric Utilities Act governs all electricity that crosses a property line. Mr. Stelmack, when he came in in 2007 or so, uh, the PC uh, Rural Caucus had agreed that they wanted to allow net metering in the province because they wanted to facilitate farmers putting up their own wind turbines and flare gas generators and biomass generators and things like that. But you have to keep in mind that the electricity generators in the province f and the wire companies feel that that's, um, and the retailers feel that that's uh, competing against them and they don't like it. So what he did was say, okay, the Electric Utilities Act basically says if you generate electricity for your own use, then the Electric Utilities Act, it doesn't apply. But if it's crossing a property line, well, you're not really generating it for your own use because you're generating it for the grid. So they agreed that if you uh, generated only the amount of energy that you used yourself, then even though the electricity was exchanged onto the grid, which is basically used by the next door neighbors, but you can pretend, reasonably so, that it's actually stored on the grid, and I can go over the details of what that means, but then you, they would deem that if you generate equal to or less than what you use, then you wouldn't have to go through the uh, Main Electric Utilities Act. So they put in the microgen regulation, which simplified the, micro, uh, the Electric Utilities Act for the purpose of people wanting to generate their own energy. And they simplified it for the purpose of approval, so you didn't have to hire me for $3,000 to get your 100-watt PV system interconnected and go through a hearing at the AUC and all that stuff. And then that you wouldn't have to pay $50 a month on meter data management fees to the wire company so that you could run your 100-watt PV system. So it was a simplification process for approvals and payment for the electricity f if you wanted to generate your own electricity. And because if you wanted to generate more than your own, and you are allowed to generate more than your own, but then you become a distribution-connected generator, you're connected under the Electric Utilities Act, you pay $3,000 to me or somebody else to connect, do all the paperwork to go through the AUC approval process, and you pay, well, EPCOR's fees are 800 bucks a year to have access to the grid. So you just would never do that with a PV system in the house. Uh, however, I had to do this myself for my house because the microgen regulation wasn't around. I had to pay $250 a year plus GST to become a member of the, electric, uh, the um, electric system operator's electricity market so that I could have the pleasure of selling $150 a year worth of ele excess electricity to them. <laughs> so you see it didn't, it was stupid. So the, everybody realized it's stupid and the, elect and the s electric system operator didn't want to deal with PV systems that would generate one ten millionth of the electricity in the province. That's what each house would do. So they said, look, this is ridiculous. Let's simplify it under those conditions. So I think it is about time it gets changed and upgraded and everything. And it has been upgraded a little bit, which is lovely. But it's, it's actually a really, really good regulation that can, will serve the government very well if they want to 
to not change the regulation, put, put in some slightly different pricing mechanisms. I can go over more details. No, that's so. great. Thank you. Uh, sorry to interrupt, but you can always corner Gordon out at the end. So anyway, um, thanks everybody for coming tonight. So thanks to Robert with IKEA, Gordon with Howell Mayhew Engineering, Clifton with Great Canadian Solar, and David with Alta Pro. Uh, for coming out and being our, uh, our panel members. I think it was really informative and enjoyed having everybody here. And thank you, Riel Bouchard from National Solar Distributors. Uh, thank you. Yeah, it's great. Thanks a lot.